GLC presents Brought to you by the donations of our faithful partners Shalom I'm Eddie Chumney of Hebraic Heritage Ministries and we welcome you today to our study on the Hebraic roots of Christianity. When we're studying the Hebraic roots of Christianity, we must remember to keep everything centered on Yeshua the Messiah. That's because in Psalm chapter 40 verse 7 it is written, Then said I, Lo I come, in the volume of the book it is written of me. That verse is quoted in Hebrews in chapter 10 in verse 7 referring to Yeshua. Then Yeshua himself said in Luke chapter 24 and verse 44, these are the words which I spake unto you while I was yet with you, that all things must be fulfilled which were written in the Torah of Moses and in the prophets and in the Psalms concerning me. So Yeshua said that the Torah, the prophets, and the Psalms or the Hebrew scriptures are written of him. So if in the volume of the book it is written of him when we're studying scripture, we need to see Yeshua and we need to keep him the center of our studies. So we have been doing a series in the last few programs where we are looking at Matthew in chapter 5 where Yeshua is teaching the Torah to the multitudes in the setting is a mountain. And we need to remember as we're looking at Yeshua's teachings here to the multitude that Yeshua is the lawgiver. James chapter 4 and verse 12 it says there's one lawgiver who is able to save. The one that saves is the lawgiver and it's Yeshua who saves. He is the lawgiver. In the way in which he teaches the Torah is through parables. In Matthew chapter 13 verse 10 the disciples came and asked him why do you speak in parables? And Yeshua answered and said, Because it's given unto you to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven. Now, the mysteries of the kingdom is the sowed level of the Torah. See, there's four primary levels to understanding the Torah. And the first level is known as the Peshat or the literal. And when you read scripture, you to initially read it at the Peshat level, the literal level. But the Peshat isn't the true and ultimate intended meaning of the text. The, the true meaning of the text is at the mystery level, at the sowed level, the hidden level. And it's at that level where Messiah is seen and the true heart and the meaning of the Torah is communicated. And so when Yeshua is teaching the Torah, he's teaching it from a sowed level of the Torah, which means that the true meaning and message in which he is communicating to his audience is at that level. So we have been going through, beginning in Matthew in chapter 5, and looking at what Yeshua is teaching and seeing the application at the sowed level. For example, he is teaching the multitudes and at the sowed level, the, the mystery level, the multitudes is a reference to Ephraim or the northern kingdom scattered into the nations of the world because the blessing that was given to Ephraim in Genesis chapter 48 verse 19 is that he would be a multitude of people or a multitude of nations. Now it's said of Ephraim in Hosea chapter 8 verse 12 that Ephraim would call the Torah a strange thing. So it, would, it was prophesied in the book of Hosea in chapter 1 that those who were initially called Lo Ami and Lo Ruhama, that is, not my people were not to be shown mercy, that the prophecy in Hosea in chapter 1 and verse 10 is 
that those who were no people would be called sons of the living God. And who is the son of the living God? It's a believer in Yeshua as the Messiah. John chapter 1 and verse 12. So, in the fulfillment of the prophecy that Ephraim or the northern kingdom would return to the Torah, they're also going to believe that Yeshua is the Messiah. So in returning to the Torah and believing that Yeshua is the Messiah, Yeshua is giving instruction to Ephraim regarding how he is to follow the Torah. Now remember, Yeshua is literally speaking to the multitudes and literally in the land of Israel. But in the mystery, the sowed level, he's teaching Ephraim who is scattered into the nations of the world. And we'll be able, hopefully, to further see how that is so in today's study. So we're going to pick up in uh, Matthew in chapter 5 in verses 21 and 22 where here Yeshua is going to be teaching for those who seek to be a bond servant of his and regarding the bond servant we are told in Exodus in chapter 21 in verses 1 and 2 and verses 5 and 6 now these are the judgments which you shall set before them if you buy a Hebrew servant, six years he shall serve, and in the seventh he shall go out free for nothing. And then verse 5, And if the servant shall plainly say, I love my master, my wife, and my children, I will not go out free. See, even though he can be free, he's choosing to serve his master because of his love for his master. So we need to believe in keep the commandments of Yeshua and serve Him because of our love and our devotion for Him. It says, this is Exodus 21 verse 6, Then his master shall bring him unto the judges, he shall also bring him to the door, into the doorpost, and his master shall bore his ear through with an awl, and he shall serve him forever. You see, a bond servant, even though he's able to be free, he wants to serve his master. So, He's going beyond the letter of the law, which says he can be free. And he wants to follow the spirit of the law. And the spirit of the law is you serve and your actions are based upon love. The two greatest commandments is to love the Lord your God with all your heart, sight, mind, soul, and strength. And to love your neighbor as yourself. The greatest commandments in the Torah is to love, and a bond servant is going to serve because he loves. So in this section talking um, about the bond servant, it says in Exodus chapter 21 verse 12, He that smites a man so that he die, he shall be put to death. And so Yeshua is referring to killing someone in Matthew chapter 5 verses 21 and 22 where he says you've heard that it was said of them of old time that you shall not kill now that's the letter of the law and whosoever will be killed will be in the danger of the judgment but I say unto you that whosoever is even angry with his brother without a cause shall be in the danger of the judgment. So Yeshua is going beyond the letter of the law and is showing the root problem of why one kills someone is because of the anger that they first have with, this, with someone else in their heart. So he's showing that it begins with anger. And now he applies this in Matthew chapter 5, verse 23 and 24, that if you will bring your gift to the altar and there remember that your brother has ought against you. The brother that he's referring to because he's teaching the multitudes which on the mystical level is a reference to Ephraim in the nations. He's teaching Ephraim that if you're going to bring your gift to the altar in your service to the God of Israel but you remember that your brother that is Judah has ought against you, and Judah does have ought against Ephraim, leave 
there your gift before the altar. Go your way and first be reconciled to your brother. Be reconciled to Judah. And then come and offer your gift. So, um, in being reconciled to your brother, Yeshua is going to go on to explain the way in which Ephraim should do this. And this is found in Matthew in chapter 7 in verses 3 through 5 where Yeshua is explaining the multitudes which is a reference to Ephraim or the northern kingdom in exile. And why do you behold the moat that is in your brother's eye? What is the moat that Ephraim or you might say non-Jews um, see in the eyes of a Jew. It is that they don't believe that Yeshua is the Messiah as a corporate people. So he says, why do you behold the moat in your brother's eye? Why do you see the problem with Judah that he doesn't believe that Yeshua is the Messiah? But you don't consider the beam in your own eye. What's the beam in Ephraim's eye? What's the beam in the eye of the non-Jew who believes that Yeshua is the Messiah? He doesn't see a need to follow the Torah. And so Yeshua is explaining in verse 4, um, How will you say to your brother, that is Judah or the Jewish people, Let me pull out the moat out of your eye. Let me tell you that Yeshua is the Messiah. But there's a beam in your own eye. You're not following the Torah. You hypocrite. First, cast out the beam in your own eye. First, seek to follow the Torah. And then, once you seek to follow the Torah, then you will see clearly to cast out the moat out of your brother's eye. So, because Yeshua is telling the multitude and teaching them about how you relate to your brother, the brother here um, is a reference to the Jewish people or the house of Judah. Now, going back to... Matthew in chapter 5, in verse 27, and verse 31 and verse 32, Yeshua teaches the following. You have heard that it was said, do not commit adultery. Of course, that is one of the Ten Commandments. But I say unto you that whoever looks on a woman to lust after her has committed adultery with her already in his heart. Once again, Yeshua is showing the root of the problem and not just saying um, uh, don't commit the letter of the law. He's showing you the spirit or the root of what causes the letter of the law to be violated. And then he goes on to explain in verses 31 and 32, it has been said, whoever shall put away his wife, let him give her a writing of divorcement. Now, this goes back to Deuteronomy chapter 24, verses 1 through 4. But I say unto you that whosoever shall put away his wife, saving for the cause of fornication, causes her to commit adultery. And whosoever shall marry her, that is divorce, commits Adultery. So first of all, we need to explain why is it that Yeshua, in speaking to the multitudes, is even teaching on the subject of divorce. Because remember, the multitudes on the deeper level is a reference to Ephraim or the northern kingdom in exile. And the northern kingdom was given a bill of divorce. In Jeremiah, in chapter 3, in verse 8, it is written, And I saw, when for all the causes whereby backsliding Israel committed adultery, I put her away and gave her a bill of divorce. Yet her treacherous sister Judah feared not, but went and played the harlot also. So the northern kingdom was given a bill of divorce. Now, in order to understand how divorce was seen in the first century, we need to understand the view of divorce by the two major Pharisaic 
um, schools of the first century. That is the school of Hillel and the school of Shammai. So in the Sanchino Midrash Rabbah, volume 5, page 299, it explains the differences between these two Pharisaic views. Rabbi Eliezer's view is accordance with the house of Shammai, Beit Shammai. Rabbi Eliezer with that of Beit Shammai. For Beit Shammai holds that a man may not divorce his wife unless he has found her to have committed an act of immorality. If he has found unseemly things in her, or things he's displeased with, doesn't like, he cannot divorce her, since he has not found her to have acted immorally. Neither can he retain her, because he has found unseemly things in her. Rabbi Joshua, however, follows Beit Hillel, the house of Hillel. For Beit Hillel says that you can divorce your wife even if she spills soup or broth. And so basically the school of Hillel taught that um, you can pretty much divorce your wife for whatever reason you find issue with her. But the school of Shammai says no, you can only divorce your wife if she has committed immorality or if she's committed whoredom. Now this is the background for understanding Matthew in chapter 19 verse 3 and verse 9 where in verse 3 the Pharisees came unto Yeshua tempting him and saying is it lawful for a man to put away his wife for every cause because he's being asked is it lawful to put away his wife for any cause most likely the person the Pharisee that's asking is from the school of Shammai and Yeshua says in verse 9, I say unto you, whosoever shall put away his wife, except it be for fornication. So you're allowed for fornication, but except it be for fornication, and shall marry another, commits adultery. And whoever marries her which is put away, does commit adultery. So here, Yeshua is siding with the view He's siding with the view of Shammai. And so remember, it was Hillel who said you could divorce for any reason. And Shammai says no, only for fornication. So Yeshua is rolling with Shammai that says no, you could only do it for fornication. Now in commenting about Yeshua's teachings on marriage and divorce as it relates to the Torah and the reasons behind it. I'm going to share with you a commentary on this from the Hebrew Greek Key Study Bible which is put out by Spiro Zodiades. And here um, he explains a more literal translation of these two very difficult verses would be, and it was said, whoever dismisses his wife, let him give her a bill of divorcement. But I say unto you that whosoever dismisses his wife, except for the reason of fornication, while she is his wife, commits adultery against her, and whoever marries one who is unjustifiably dismissed, is considered as committing adultery, referring to Matthew chapter 19, verses 3 through 9. And so he goes on to explain, it is assumed many times when these and similar verses, for example, Matthew in chapter 5, verse 32, and Luke chapter 16, verse 18 are read, that the one who is divorced should not remarry. However, in the situations that Jesus dealt with, the person that was put away was innocent. Jesus was addressing the issue here of a spouse divorcing a mate with the mere excuse that the desire to be married 
to that particular person was gone, which is the view of the Pharisaic school of Hillel. The only just cause for divorce, Yeshua teaches, is fornication. Consequently, anyone who was unjustly divorced acquired the false stigma that they were guilty of moral misconduct. And it's for that reason, in order to protect uh, the person who is being given the divorce, the Lord insisted in Deuteronomy chapter 24 verses 1 through 4 that what is written there be adhered to. That is, the person that unjustly dismisses an innocent mate ought to clear them of guilt by providing them with a bill of divorcement. In the case that the dismissed spouse was guilty of fornication, the Mosaic law required that he or she perhaps be stoned. Deuteronomy chapter 22 verse 21. Making a bill of divorcement unnecessary and go through the test of one who is acu accused of committing adultery. And that test is in Numbers in chapter 5. The Lord concerns himself only here in his teaching with the innocent party and not with the one who is merely able to secure a legal divorce. It is important to remember that Jesus never forbade the innocent party to remarry. In fact, Jesus accepted that the innocent party might remarry. And so... In teaching about being a bond servant and following the Torah, in Exodus chapter 21, where it talks about one who commits himself to be a bond servant, therein it is written in that chapter, Exodus chapter 21, verses 24 through 26, eye for eye, tooth for tooth, hand for hand, foot for foot, burning for burning, wound for wound, stripe for stripe. And if a man smite the eye of his servant or the eye of his maid, that it perish, he shall let him go free for his eye's sake. Um, so what I read there was Exodus chapter 21 verses 24 through 26. But now I want to go to Exodus chapter 22 verses 25 and 26 where it says if you lend money to any of my people that is poor by you you shall not be to him as a usurer neither shall you lay upon him usury if you at all take your neighbor's raiment to pledge you shall deliver it unto him by that the sun goes down so now we go to Matthew chapter and verses 38 through 42 where Yeshua teaches you've heard that it said an eye for an eye a tooth for a tooth I say unto you resist not evil but whosoever shall smite you on the right cheek turn to him the other also and if a man will sue you at the law and take away your coat let him have your cloak also and whosoever shall con you to go a mile go with him two miles give to him that which he asked and from him that would borrow of you turn not away so the principle of what Yeshua is teaching here is that if you're being asked to go a mile go two miles in other words go beyond the letter of the law follow the spirit of the law and a bond servant will follow the spirit of the law because you are to love your neighbor as yourself. Matthew chapter 5 verses 43 and 44. You have heard that it was said you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say unto you love your enemies. Bless them that curse you. Do good to them that hate you. And pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you. Once again the principle is go beyond the letter of the law. Now in the Torah Anthology on the Book of the Twelve Prophets, volume 2 on page 
81. Referring to Leviticus chapter 19, verse 18, you will love your neighbor as yourself. Loving your fellow men as yourself, the rabbis teach, is the same as fulfilling everything else in the Torah. And so, if you're going to follow the highest form of the Torah, which is to show love, you will be a servant and you will not just follow the letter of the law, you will follow the spirit of the law as well. And this is the heart of what Yeshua is teaching to the multitudes. How to follow the Torah in believing that He is the Messiah. And in this lesson we also saw how Yeshua taught the multitudes how to relate to their brother, which is a reference to the house of Judah or the Jewish people, given that the multitudes that he's speaking to is Ephraim scattered in the nations. Now, when we follow Yeshua, 1 John chapter 2, verse 6, we ought to walk as he walked. How did he walk? He followed the Torah of his father. And he instructed those who believed on him in John chapter 14, verse 15, to love him by keeping his commandments. Loving him and keeping his commandments is being his bond servants. Shalom. In Yeshua the Messiah, Amen.